So hi, Judy, how are you? I'm very good, how about you? I am fine. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Jeff Lowenfels, and I'm talking to Dr. Judith Fitzpatrick. How are you? What's Very going good, on? Thank you. And it's 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 a little dangerous here talking to a lawyer turned gardener. <laughs> right, right. And who plays the scientist on Instagram? So it's very dangerous. But for yes. my it's very dangerous to speak to a uh, microbiologist, virologist, uh, scientist. So you know we're all in, we're all in dangerous territory. So we'll just work. yes. We'll... So what what that, that in addition to COVID? What is your background? Well, I have a PhD in microbiology from a medical school. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I went into immunology. So in, um, in microbiology, because immunology, you know, microbiology includes uh, immunology, right. includes DNA studies all started there because it's easier to get DNA from a microbe than from a person, okay. especially in the beginning. So I, I and I developed my medical diagnostic tests. Basically, so, I have eleven patents in that area because I was really into making antibodies and working with you know immunological reactions between you know things like the COVID virus and making a lysis like they're making for them now. Well, uh, would you rather be doing that than uh, making microbiometers? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. A little safer where you are right when now. When I was working for Beckton Dickinson, yeah, they offered to make me head of the team to develop the immunoassay for AIDS, oh. HIV. Yeah, and I was going to have, I was going to be, you know, put into the to the Bronx. Yeah, we were supposed to work twelve hours a day in this one space, I was going to have a bunch of people and never go home because yeah. so of the danger of getting infected by growing up the virus. Yeah, but now you, you're you working 24 hours a day. You're <laughs> you're you're living at, at the same place you work uh, yeah. and you can get a virus from the people you're working with. So, you know, you can't win either way. It's, it's not HIV. No. You know, I, I really believe in safety. I. I would never work on anything dangerous more than eight hours a day hmm, because I've just seen it. You know, like we all know you make mistakes and the tired you get, the more likely you are to make mistakes. Sure, you know, we all, yep. we all know that. Yep. But I wanted to ask you your opinion today about yes. microbial community. Right. And I found it so fascinating. So tell us a little more. Well, you know, you and I, we, we spend an inordinate amount of time reading stuff. Uh, and there's an awful lot of free time to read these days. And a lot of stuff that's being printed about uh, mycorrhizal fungi, other kinds of, of, of fungi, bacteria, and the communities that, that are set up in the rhizosphere around plants, around plant roots, uh, the diversity that exists, what that diversity means, how it operates, the interactions between different microbes, uh, as well as the interactions between the plants. So we know from soil food web, you know, just basic soil food. Like, here I am, I have a bear bell in my hand. I got to take it out of my hand. Uh, we 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 got a bear on our property, so uh, when I go outside and garden, I, I have to carry a bear bell. So we we know from basic soil food web that that there's a relationship between all of these organisms. And when Soil Food Web was, when the book was written, Team with Microbes, you know, back in 2006 and then redone in 2011, there was a certain quantum of information known, but I think, I think the appreciation of the uh, interaction in this diverse community and, and, and how important that is wasn't as well known as it is now. And so on a daily basis, you and I are both reading articles uh, that talk about the importance of diversity um, for all sorts of different reasons, not the least of which is that there's some symbiotic relationships between the various microbes that aid the plant. And, and it's fascinating stuff. And so it's just, people are studying it like crazy. And if, if someone's out there and they're a potential, you know, PhD student, this is the kind of stuff that really is helping 
uh, agricultural people, uh, you know, cannabis growers, vin viniculturists, uh, be able to develop and use products uh, in a much more effective way than just plain old NPK products were used. Does that make any sense? I think it does. Well, I mean, I think what we've seen and, and shared with you before, too, is, you know, that there's a lot that the microbes bring to the soil and to the plant that is not measured in chemical tests. Right. No. Because the microbes can actually, you know, take not just the rhizobia that are on the plant, but there are other microbes in the soil that actually capture nitrogen from the air right. and return it. And when you have a healthy population, you have a lot more of those. That's right. I mean, well, the, thing that, the thing that fascinates me is how these microbes actually work together with one another sure. to help one another. Sure. sure. Well, you know, uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be shameless. I'm going to plug my uh, my uh, teeming with nutrients book, because I always tell people when you read that book and you finish the book, you, you, you have to just sort of sit back for a second and realize that what goes on inside a plant cell goes on in society. And and uh, these microbes are part of a of a society. So let's take let's take something that most people understand those rhizobia microbes. Uh, these are nitrogen fixing microbes. They're free living in the soil. They are attracted to the plant root. They go into the plant root and switch their form, which I don't understand at all. Maybe you can explain that in a minute. They switch their form and they turn into what's known as a bacterioid uh, and they and they live in a different form than uh, just if they were living out in the soil and they fix nitrogen. Now, along comes uh, fungi, these, these mycorrhizal fungi. Now we know that the same plant can be infected by the fungi as well as by the uh, rhizobia bacteria. Okay, so they're, they're both living in the same plant. Now what's that fungi doing? That fungi is going out there and getting phosphorus and zinc and nitrogen and metals uh, and bringing it back to the plant. Now, a lot of those things are needed in order to make the enzyme, in order for the bacteria, the rhizobia bacteria, to make the enzyme that it needs to have in order to convert air nitrogen into fixed nitrogen. So all of a sudden you've got the fungi providing materials to the rhizobia bacteria that the bacteria need in order to make nitrogenase and uh, there's a hemoglobin, uh, special hemoglobin molecule. And if the fungi keep feeding the stuff, well, the bacteria go, wow, we can make more of these nodules. And so they do. And so you get more nodules on a soybean plant uh, if you've got the mycorrhizae feeding the plant at the same time. This is pretty amazing stuff. It took a long, long time for people to figure it out. And people still are not absolutely sure that the answer I just gave you is the right answer. It just seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, well, I mean, they know that if you have AMF, you have more rhizobia on, right. uh, on the soybean plant right. or right. the other, uh, other plants that require, you know, both. Absolutely. Now, what they what they don't know, and I'm sure somebody's studying it, so and maybe somebody knows it. I just haven't read the article. What's happening to the free living uh, uh, rhizobia that are nitrogen fixing? Free, there are free living rhizobia that live in the soil. Are they getting fed by fungi? Is it a different kind of fungi? It's just it's a very very uh, fluid area of study. Um, so, for example. Uh, we know that a lot of these plants, they're not infected by, cannabis happens to be, we think, infected by just one, but, you know, a, a carrot or something like that can be infected by three or four different kinds of, my, of, of mycorrhizal fungi. And, you know, does that make a difference if the rhizobial plant, for example, is infected by different kinds of fungi than the normally infected? Do you get more? I mean, all of these things are being studied and they're all 
turning out to be things that 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 enable scientists to then convert stuff into useful useful information like you did for the microbiometer uh i say microbiometer you say microbiometer i don't know what it is but um, potato <laughs> yeah exactly right and so and and so you know one of the reasons why you and i talk so much is because that instrument is a tool that is going to help us study these relationships first of all maybe even to tell whether the relationships are happening um so all of this stuff is just god it's crazy exciting stuff it's, you know the analogies between our society being a community and trading also is very very interesting i mean the data showing that the that the fungi actually trade phosphorus yeah carbon, and they can hold off sharing their phosphorus with the plant if they don't feel the plant is giving them enough enough carbon yeah i mean it's just like you know so we we have a we have a lockup because of the virus uh and all of a sudden the economy drops down we have you know 16 million people who are you know who, who aren't working uh you know same thing happens in the soil if there isn't the right amount of nutrients if there isn't this diversity of uh you know of, of of microbes to support all of a sudden things just go to crap uh and and it's just like that in in, in soil so um you know that that that's what's what's kind of kind of cool uh and it, and it makes the plant grow and it makes the soil soil and it makes the soil good soil and uh it's all kind of fun stuff uh god just... but you know like but bacteria which are the basis of the food web. So they right. feed everything basically above them. Okay. Yeah. They have such small amount of DNA that they can't make all the things that they need right. for their own nutrition. Yeah. So, they gotta... so, so one bacteria makes vitamin A, one makes vitamin B, one, 12, whatever. And they've actually shown like, you know, that you'll have a, a, a culture and you won't see, you know, this this you know this back, particular bacteria come up until you add like vitamin B, or until there's present a bacteria that grows vitamin B. And right. if people want to see that, the amazing thing is to take some of your soil and plate it on 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 ag agar. You can leave that at room temperature, and for 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 months, for six months, I did it, and new different looking culture uh colonies came up every week during that sure. six month period sure. because one was making something that was a nutrient for another right right yeah it's and and uh then one is taking over by eating the other ones uh yeah you can do the same thing by taking yeah, take baby oatmeal wet in soil you know don't cook it uh, and and mix it up, and you will get in, unbelievable that white fuzzy stuff, which incidentally, too many people think is a mycorrhizal fungi. I don't think it's a mycorrhizal fungi. I think it's an indication that you've got fungi in your soil, but I don't think it's a mycorrhizal fungi. But in any case, uh, and then all of a sudden you start seeing different colors, and uh, uh, it's just it's fascinating. I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the name of the the column that you can make. It's a Russian name uh oh you, yeah yeah those columns are beautiful i forgot right. that all these anaerobic little zones and some aerobics and it's just beautiful with all the different kinds of microbes that grow in the stuff and and if you're growing a plant as as people who are listening to us right now are and you don't have that diversity your plants aren't doing well that's the bottom line uh and and You've got to have a diversity. If it, if if it was only one kind of bacteria, the plant it catches up to the plant. It just doesn't work. Uh, and so that's that's one of the reasons why we we, we try to push compost. It's got a lot of diversity in it. Uh, why we put different kinds of things in our soil. Hopefully, we're adding more bacteria. You know, we probably aren't, but sometimes we are. Uh, we, 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 we are always searching if we're soil food webbies for diversity in the soil. Uh, and, and part of it is because of these synergisms 
between the microbes themselves, not just because the plant needs more than just what one microbe can provide it. Uh, so, so it's something that we study all the time. And, and again, going back to your instrument, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, the ability to be able to measure whether or not we've got a change in the mass of microbes is important. Now, we were talking earlier about a microbiometer, uh, and you know, it doesn't tell you that you've got 15,000 different kinds and what the, those 15,000 different kinds are. But if you get a number of 800, you got a tremendous number of microbes in your soil sample or in your soil, whatever you took the sample from. You have a tremendous diversity into it. How do I know yes. that? How do I know that? Because your plants are probably doing well. If your plants aren't doing well, I, I, you know, then I might say, okay, there's a problem here. I've got 800, but my plants aren't doing well. So then we try to figure out what the problem is. But that's a very rare occurrence when you have an 800 on the microbiome. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people shown that. I mean, I've just been talking to, uh, communicating with Clive uh, Kirkby. Okay, now who's you know, okay. and he talks about the fact that, you know, you really need a nutrient balance. So it's so important when, you know, you're really not feeding your soil. Like people see feed, soil doesn't eat, microbes eat. Right, right. So, you know, you're feeding the microbes in your soil and you have a community there already. So probably when you're putting down compost and everything, I, I've calculated for a lot of the dilutions they use. It's like mm -hmm. putting two Americans, dropping two Americans into China and saying they're going to take over. Yeah. They're not, you know. Yeah. Even <laughs> they if they can't multiply virus. that fast. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, basically what you're talking about is, and, and we've seen it before, that it's the nutrients in that. So we did an experiment with James Satillo, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sowing sod growth with his compost, which was so wonderful and everything. Mm -hmm. And actually we got the same result if we boiled the compost as if we didn't. Hmm. So there. it was the nutrients in the compost. And actually I was repeating an experiment done by Kirkby. But where are the nutrients? actually where, where sterilized, the uh, you know, uh, for fertilizer from rumens of, of cattle. Okay. So, I mean, and I think people are emphasizing that you have a community in your field and your community is going to defend itself. And the field that you have, it's existing there, that field, you know, has been supporting those microbes in that population for a long time. These, these guys are getting along, okay? Um, you, you, you can make big changes that will make changes in how that happens, but you have to work with your basic soil and your basic soil type. I mean, one of the things people ask us is, what's a good microbial number mm -hmm. and that to a large extent depends on your soil what they call edaphic features you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some soils are capable of storing a lot more organic carbon or soil organic carbon than other soils and unless you went in and drastically changed the structure of your soil etc you're not going to be able to change that let me let me stop you right there. What what if you what if you were using biochar? As so many people who are listening today do. Their soils have a lot of biochar in it because biochar is a great condominium for microbes. Uh, no, well it, it is, and usually microbial count goes down when they put biochar down. And what they've actually done is they've increased uh, the soil organic soil organic carbon, and the the biochar that's there is kind of permanently stored because it's very difficult to break that down. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's persisted for like 3,000 years in the Amazon forest and everything. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it seems to work very, very well. It's very, it's, it's an inexpensive, it's a, an, I mean, an expensive way to remediate soil. Yeah, or... or but, but it's very good when it works. It works excellently. I wouldn't put anything against, but you can't run our tests with biochar because the particles are very small, almost uh, the size of micro microbes 
and they they, they show up in our tests. They they so, read as if they were microbes in our test. But what if I have what if I have uh, some biochar in my soil? I'm growing auto flowers. I throw some biochar in there. I can get a I can get a baseline using using the microbiometer. Can I? Can I? Well, so in I, other words, I, 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 I did some. I, I worked a little bit with this with uh, at Dr. Tice's lab in Cornell, mm -hmm. and what we saw was that uh, based on the age of the soil that had been amended with biochar, uh, it it, aff it affected our our test much less. So they had earthworms in this soil, I believe, and so as the biochar is broken down into smaller and smaller pieces then it, it ceases to affect our assay uh, after about a year when she applied it. But I don't know, you know, what the size of the particles sure. she put down, and I don't know about the number of, you know, sure. of the digestive, I, you know. But what, I, what I'm asking is if, if you have biochar in your soil mix, you take a test, you get a reading of 300, that's your baseline. You know, you take several tests. You get a reading of 300 average. Then you then you apply, you know, super duper uh, kiss compost tea, and uh, you take a test, and it comes out at 400. 300 yeah. for baseline. So, no, so that would work. And actually, we have a customer who is doing that. It's a customer who makes a biochar amendment, and they are using our test and doing it exactly the way you do it. Okay. But uh, but but they're doing it in a, in a controlled manner, so they do have a control. Sure. So so what's the highest, uh, uh, Brandon uh, uh, just came, came up, what's your highest number that you've ever? The highest number we've ever seen comes from uh, a fellow in Florida who does strawberry farming Okay, yeah. in very rich soil, and it was almost 2,000. Wow. Hey, gosh, that's not soil you'd want to fall into. You'd end up, well, you'd end up with a longer beard than, than this. And, yeah, that's pretty incredible. And and it's, it's incredible. And I think some of these engineered soils, you know, these biologically engineered soils do have, you know, microbes that high. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and I've been telling people, and I don't know if I've been telling them properly, but you know, if you if your soil supports plant, you know, again, I, I always go back to the fact that uh, someone once said to me, well, gee, this test is no good. It doesn't tell you what the microbe is. It doesn't tell you whether it's, a, you know, whether it's a beneficial microbe. And, and what I always say to people is, first of all, I'm testing soil that I've got plants growing in and the soil smells good. There's, those are two things that tell me the soil is not anaerobic and, and is benefit, full of beneficial microbes. Um, you don't have to know the exact name of the microbe to know that you're using you're using good soil. But I tell people if they've got a 300, 400 that area, you know that's that's getting to be okay soil. You get up to 500, 600, you probably don't have to put down too much uh, fertilizer, uh, micro foods, what I ought to call it. But um, is that is that in keeping with what your stuff is showing? I I just was you know reading a bunch of articles from Kirkby. Mm -hmm. And what he was saying was, even if we're working organically, we're working with the microbes, we have to account for the amount of like nitrogen and phosphorus that the crop is going to take out of the soil. Sure. So he says there's an NPK, a CNPS ratio mm -hmm. uh, that occurs in the um, in the soil around the plant mm -hmm. and he gives you that ratio mm -hmm. and so he makes up a solution that has that amount of that and puts that on along with the fertilizer that he's using mm -hmm. and he does that uh, to the amount of that that they've calculated that the crop will be removing from the soil based on their acreage use. And he's been able to show that doing that, they don't use any, lose any yield, okay? They've cut runoff, okay? And they're sequestering carbon at a great rate. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, but but it has to be played with. Like, are you putting too much down? If you put too much of this th this carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, you're going to kill off those microbes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to inhibit them because you're going to inhibit the plant from putting out the exudates that supports them. Right. Okay. If you put it, if you put down just enough that you don't inhibit them, they'll actually take up and multiply at that time. Sure. And they'll store that th that nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and release it slowly to the plant. So we we're just talking to a farmer recently, just this week actually who is very interested to work with us to see if they can cut back on how many times a year they have to fertilize. Because mm -hmm. he says it's a big, you know, it's a big cost to go out there four times a year and go into the field and, and add fertilizer. If they can even cut back one by making sure that the microbes are, are, are storing right. that, that, fer, that fertilizer. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, what, what you're describing, of course, is the is the uh, the law of return, because they're in an agricultural situation. They're taking out of the out of the system what normally would be feeding the microbes and and supplying food for the plant the following year. That's what we do if we're growing grapes. That's what we do if we're growing cannabis, fruits, vegetables. Anytime we remove stuff out of the garden or out of the growing situation we are violating that law of return. So, so what your instrument helps us do is, is sort of figure out whether, whether we've got things back in balance. Now, it doesn't tell us everything we need, but it helps an awful lot. And, and I'm wondering whether, uh, whether you get to a point, certainly if you're looking at a number of 2,000, that number wouldn't be there if there wasn't something for those microbes to eat. Uh, when when uh, Brand, oh, absolutely. you know, Brandon has a number of eighteen twenty five or whatever it is. We we know there's something there for that microbe to eat. At what point do we, you know? And again, these are all experiments. This is a brand new instrument, folks. People are just learning what it can do, and so that these experiments are being run. At what point do you get? What number? What is the number? The threshold where, you know where you've got problems, where you need to say, okay, I need to feed. Uh, well, these are smaller plots, you know, yeah. and they're intensively farmed of course. Sometimes with many, many uh, crops per year. Mm -hmm. In fact, they go out and they actually, um, you know, for, uh, fumigate. Yeah. In between each crop. And, and then we went and looked up fumigation and basically, and people are interested. Fumigation is supposed to be uh, really tough, more 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 tough on pathogens than on regular microbes. Mm -hmm. But within two weeks, the they're whole back. they're back. They're all back. They're back. They're they're start back day one. I mean, they're coming up from below because the fumigation only affects the top a uh, few inches of the soil. It doesn't it sound very it doesn't sound very organic to me. Pardon doesn't sound very organic to me. It's not organic, but not all of our users are organic. That's I mean, uh, but I'm not eating those. I'm not eating those strawberries. I, you know, we're going to have to compromise and work together with people because farmers right now, a lot of them can't afford to get lower yields. I mean, True. True. and and if they're transitioning to organic, it takes at least three years. And during that time, they can't sell as, as organic. They can't really afford to take big cuts. Now, do they have to put NPK or, or carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus down along with a green manure? No, they can use like chicken uh, um, yeah. fertilizer or beef fertilizer. And like chicken is very high in nitrogen and some other minerals. And, you know, so different fertilizers will balance out their green manure and still allow them to stay organic. I like to say micro food. You're still saying fertilizer. That's hard. Though. Well, yeah, I mean, they call green manure is fertilizer. Right? I call it micro food. 
I think it's a bad name, but that's just me. I'm, I'm a cranky old man. I'm allowed to be, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, uh, yeah, but I think in the long in the long run, what happens is we, we need to get people back again in the small scale farming. What what you created is an instrument that certainly would work on big scale as well. But but I think it's just ideal for a, you know a small situation where you're where you're concentrated, where you're able to where you're able to pivot quickly. Where you can change stuff, you know, to be able to measure without having to wait three weeks and your growing season's half over, you know, it just makes so much sense to me. It just, I don't know what we did without it, frankly. Uh, I know what we did without it. We used to, we used to do tests, and they weren't very accurate tests because how can I, I, I you know, those NPK test kits, they're not any good. So right. I, I mean, I, 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 good. I could be wrong. I don't want to get slipped. Well, we worked with University of Tennessee. You know, you worked with us. Yeah. And, and um, we were the only test that actually measured soil health. The test that used NPK did not measure soil health. No, of course not. Uh, but they did, they did phospholipid fatty acid analysis or other. It seems to be our correlation with soil organic carbon. Okay. Oh, absolutely. But how do we get how do we get the uh, USDA, you know, of course, to understand and to approve? It's a very difficult thing when you come up with a new test like you've come up with. It's not easy to, you know, it's not it's not easy to come along all of a sudden. First of all, as a woman, let's let's talk about this. You're a woman. Uh, you've been in the medical field, you know, so all of a sudden you come up with a with a with a tried and tested situation that's cheaper than what the corporates have been able to do for a long time, uh, and and displaces an awful lot of scientists who've really kind of made their career based upon studies that have done using one technique or another, and then you come along with something new. Man, oh man, this is it's a tough break in. Well, I'll tell you, the really big problem is I was hanging out with people like you. <laughs> That is a broke the ice. You uh, know, you've well, been at it for twenty years yeah. singing this song, yeah. and I heard the song well, somebody, <laughs> and became a convert. They, and I think that means our time is up. Oh, oh okay. Well, we're going. Somebody, okay. So go, until next week at four o'clock. Yeah, but well, let me just say, somebody just said the, the, you can bury your underwear and get the same kind of results from the test, and that may be true, but it takes you two months. You use the biometer, and it happens in 10 minutes. That's all I got to say. Hey, it was yeah. fun. Do it again. Well, the, the, what will de, the, the, what, what devours your underwear are the bacteria, the fungi that are breaking down. Right, soil. right. It's not, it doesn't measure the um, mycorrhizal fungi that are the ones that are going to colonize your plant and help your plant. But it will tell you that you're, at least your soil is alive uh, and, that, and that you've got some structure being made. And there's a good chance that if that's happening, there's some good mycorrhizal fungi in there as well. So, uh, But anyway, what fun. Oh, okay. Have a good weekend.